Uh, the people just a few minutes to come on. Uh, let my group know I'm live. So we can dive into tonight's topic. <clears throat> course, uh, there we go. I'm waiting on everybody to... Okay. I am live now on Facebook. All right. So tonight is, uh, it's the second Thursday. So that is, that means it's time for No More Genies. And No More Genies means that we are getting rid of our genie concept of God. We are no longer believing myths. We are no longer believing hearsay. We are no longer believing mama and them and traditions of men. And however you grew up, we're getting rid of, <coughs> excuse me, everything that isn't what God said. Everything that's not in the word, everything that cannot be backed up by scripture because that type of bad teaching has messed people up for quite some time, quite some time. And so anyway, you hear me talk about that uh, in the first one. So I very, very strongly encourage you to go back and watch No More Genius from the beginning. Um, and you can find that either on my YouTube channel or you can find it uh, here on my Facebook page. If you want to find it anywhere, look up hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG, and it'll take you right to all of my No More Genie stuff. Okay? All right. So we're going to dive right in because it's 7 o'clock and we need to uh, get going. So. All right. So let's say a word of prayer and we're going to dive right in. Thank you, Lord, for another session of No More Genies. Thank you, God, for your word, which hasn't changed. Thank you, oh God, that we have an anchor to our souls. Thank you, oh God, for just the desire to know you and to know more of you and to know the truth about you. And thank you, oh God, to know that we have to know what your promises are so we can stand on them, oh God, that you don't want us making up stuff but you rather want us to understand what you said so we can use that against the devil so we can stand on your word so we can count on it and believe it because you're stable and steady like a rock. So please forgive me for any sin. Oh God, I crucify myself right now. Please fill me with the Holy Ghost and breathe through me. Let what is said be what you want said so that you might be glorified in all things so that the saints might be edified that the demons might be terrified and the unbelievers might be challenged to turn from their ways and to seek you. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. So what we're talking about tonight is no more genies. Oh, it's my sister messaging. Okay. So what we're talking about tonight is, so when you see NMG, that stands for no more genies. We're talking about no more genies. And this is number 31. And that's who is God, part three. Who is God, part three. All right, so obviously that means there's two more parts <laughs> that I've already done. And uh, you can look those up on the page. I definitely suggest that you look at the whole series uh, because <clears throat> There's a lot that is packed into each episode. And so I'm going to be sure you get the full, you know, full understanding because that's the whole point. The whole point <laughs> of uh, doing the No More Genie series is so that we can be biblically accurate, so that we can build our faith on what the word says. Okay. And I'm going to put that on the screen so we can build our faith on what the word says. And I have discovered. And I've actually been amazed to discover about how many different people don't have that strong word background. And I must admit that for a while, I kind of took it to granted, took it for granted because I grew up as my sister. 
because I take it for granted because I grew up around a lot of people that love the Lord and I grew up a lot around a lot of people that love the word and I grew up around a lot of people that wanted to us to be sure that we got it too. And so I grew up with a strong word background. And then when I went to college first time, the church I went to, the pastor, uh, uh, Reverend uh, B.J. Tatum of B.J. Tatum of Canaan Baptist Church of Banner, Illinois, a strong word pastor. I mean, super strong word pastor. And he always said that his goal, his desire was for us to be doctrinally sound, that he didn't want us to uh, not understand how to exegete the scriptures, not understand why we were saved and, and and how we got saved and what that meant. And he also labored very hard to be sure that we would be able to articulate our faith, meaning that that we weren't just, uh, you know, coming with emotions and, and, and but we could actually explain when and how we got saved and we could lead other people to Christ because he also had a strong evangelical anointing. Pastor Tatum had a strong a desire to win lost souls and teach other people how to do the same. So growing up the way I did and then that experience when I was uh, going to college first time absolutely changed my life. It absolutely changed my life for the better. But I've discovered that everyone doesn't always have the same type of strong word background. And sometimes we learn a little bit of truth. We learn a little bit of truth. Oh, I still got my gloves on. We learn a little bit of truth in church. And then you know what we do? We take them two scriptures we learned, and then we try to live off that for the rest of our lives. And that's just like your parents feeding you once when you were five. And then, you know, you either never, never eat again or you take that same food. And you don't eat that same food like you did when you were five. But many times that's what we do spiritually. And so... That's why it's so important that you base. It's so important that you have a good, strong concept of God. And it's so important that you base it on what the word says. You base it on what the word says. Okay. One of the favorite tricks of the enemy is to bring stuff in your life to do you harm, do you damage, to do everything you can to torment you, humiliate you, mock you, make you feel bad about yourself, hurt you. If you can't, straight up kill you, he'll try to hurt you so bad you wish you were dead. And then he'll turn around and tell you that somehow that is God's fault. Or then he'll turn around and tell you somehow that is God's will. And that's why so many people end up being abused by religion, because those are mean religious people that don't bit more know the Lord than my left shoe know how to be right. <laughs> those are people full of the devil because God would never want stuff like that to happen to you. God would never bring stuff like that in your life. That's the enemy bringing stuff like that in your life. But sometimes he comes with a church face on. So that's why, and the enemy is also not above misquoting scripture, which is what he did to the Lord in Matthew 4. Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness after he got baptized in the Jordan River, the devil came at him and the second temptation, the devil used scripture. And he, he quoted Psalm 91, where he told the Lord uh, about how he'd given his angels charge over him. So he's trying to tempt Jesus to throw himself off a mountain and then demand that God catch him. And the Lord said, no, because that's tempting God. So the Bible just told you that the devil is not above twisting scripture. The devil is not above taking scripture out of context to try to trip you up. So if that's what we're dealing with, over the course of our lives, and it makes all the sense in the world, then we would need to get to know God. We would need to get to know his voice. We would get to know the leading of his spirit. We would need to get to know the scriptures, that we need some type of solid foundation, something that that you can hold on to in your core. Because what's going to happen is when you get serious about your walk with God, you can count on things coming your way that's going to try to shake you to your core. And I mean they're going to shake you to your core. And you're going to have to have something more solid to stand on than how you feel. Okay? So that's what No More Genies is about, is No More Genie concept of God where we think all we have to do is rub the lamp or say the magic words or, you know, do the hokey pokey and put your left foot in and put your right foot out. <laughs> and that's how you get things. But rather, 
we can stand on with thus saith the Lord. And so to do that, you have to start with a solid concept of God. You have to see God in the right way. Okay, so that's what this series is about. So again, tonight is part three. So as I did in the first two parts, I'm going to give you some principles that I'm going to show you the scriptures, where those principles come from to make sure that your concept of God is right, which is why I strongly recommend that you watch the first two parts of this new series, Who is God? So you can get all the principles and all the scriptures. Okay. Okay. So. First thing I want to talk about tonight is that God is a gentleman. He does not force his love or his grace on anyone. And that is found in Revelation 2.20, excuse me, Revelation 3.20, Revelation 3.20. God is a gentleman. He does not force his love or his grace on anyone. Well, what does that scripture say? Yeah, I will tell you. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. That's the Berean Study Bible. Uh, King James Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So sup is uh, old school for supper which means dining. So the Lord is talking about the evening meal or that he will commune and fellowship with you uh, through a meal, sup with him, dine with him, eat with him. Okay. So the Lord says, uh, some translations say, look, the New International Version says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So the Lord says, I'm here, but I'm standing at the door. If the Lord is standing at the door, that means he's not busting the door down. So whenever you feel that pressure, that stuff trying to force its way in your life, that's the devil. Because the Lord says, that's not what I'm doing. The Lord says, I stand at the door. And then the Lord says, I knock. Okay, he says he's standing at the door and he's knocking. And there is your proof that the Lord is a gentleman. That he does not force is over his grace on anyone that he does not barge his way into anybody's life because he doesn't. He knocks at the door of your heart. And then he said, there's a couple of things that you have to do. Remember I told you, there's always a component in faith where something is required of you. Always an act of faith, always putting some works behind your faith, but there's something you have to do. It's different with every promise and it's different with every situation which is why you have to know the scriptures and know the Lord and ask him, what is it that I'm supposed to do about this particular thing? But in this thing, when the Lord is talking about fellowship, he says a couple of things you got to do. The first thing he has to do is he says, you have to hear his voice. If anyone hears my voice. Now, why is that important? Why would Jesus say that? I'll tell you why. Because it means you have to be listening for his voice. <laughs> what do you do when you're in the house and the baby's crying and your cell phone is blowing up, your cell phone is ringing and the oven timer is going on and they're picking up the trash outside and the dog is barking. What do you do? What do you do when all that stuff happens? I'll tell you what you do. What you do is you hone in on the sound that's most important to you. So if the baby's crying and the kind of cry that the baby has is taking precedent, over everything else that's going on, then it doesn't matter about the oven timer going off and it doesn't matter about all the noise that garbage men are making outside. It doesn't matter about the dog barking because you're listening for the cry of the baby. You're listening for the cry of the child. So for you to know or to recognize when the Lord is speaking to you, you have to be listening. That's why the Bible says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. That's why the Bible says that you have to have bent your ear towards listening to God. And a lot of people do not. They are consumed. You know how I know that? Because a lot of people don't have daily quiet time with the Lord. They don't have time with the Lord in the morning. They just rush out the house, grab a cup of coffee, grab, excuse me, a cup of coffee, grab a bagel, do something. Don't have time to spend time with the Lord. 
Well, think about you and your best friend. The reason you're close to your best friend now is because you all spend time together, because you know them, because you've been through some stuff together. It's no different in your relationship with the Lord. And the more time you spend with him, the more you get to know his voice. But you have to be listening for it because the voice of God may not sound like what you thought. So that's why the Lord said, the first thing you have to do is hear my voice. But then the second thing you have to do, the Lord says, is that you have to open the door. Now, I remember the first time I read that scripture, I remember the first time I got an understanding of what that meant. The Lord said, you have to open the door. That means the Lord is not going to knock it down. What do you do? If you're waiting and waiting and waiting and you think you're waiting on God because you thought God was going to barge in because you thought God was just going to make something happen because you thought a whole bunch of things about God that weren't true. And God is actually standing at the door knocking because you didn't know that he was a gentleman. Because you didn't know that he was a gentleman. You didn't know that he's waiting on you to hear his voice. And you didn't know that he's waiting on you to open the door. Okay? He's waiting on you to open the door. So you got to hear his voices means you have to be listening for it. You got to be familiar with it so you know that's God talking. And then you have to open the door. Then the Bible says, then. Then the Bible says, then I will come in and dine with him and he with me. So the Lord said, we'll share a meal together. We'll fellowship. I will dine with him and he with me. Okay? So you're going to have supper with the Lord. You're going to fellowship with the Lord. Now, if none of that happens, it's not God's fault. And this is what people don't understand. This is what unbelievers don't understand. And this is what some believers don't understand. Is that God is standing there opening his hand, reaching out. Okay? Reaching out, knocking on the door of your heart. But you're not listening. That's why America is under so much judgment now. That's why we're struggling so much now. Because it's not the Lord, it's not that God is not talking. It's that just that we're not listening. And when you won't open the door and let the Lord in, that's when you find the enemy just running rampant all over. Because you've got to hear his voice and you've got to open the door. And then we fellowship. Because the Lord is a gentleman. He's not going to force his love or his grace on anyone. Okay? Let's move on, move on to principle number two. All right. And it's one of my favorites. Now, this is, is something that's been argued about for as far back as I can remember being a Christian. I don't ever remember a time in my life where I didn't hear somebody arguing about this here, what I'm finna say. And here it is. Once you are saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. Once you get born again, that's 1 John 5, 11 and 12. Once you get born again, once you become part of God's family, you are part of God's family. You can never not be a part of the kingdom. Once you are saved, you're always saved. That's a doctrine called eternal security. And so many different people have different positions on it. But once you are saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. First John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the record out of the King James Version. And this is the record that God had given to us eternal life. And his life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. If you got Jesus, you got eternal life. And there's another scripture that I want to read with you that I just thought of. Okay. That is Ephesians 1 and 13. In whom you also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. See, when you get saved, it's not just that you're, oh, let me write that down, Ephesians 1.13. You don't just get born again, you get sealed. And you get sealed by the Holy Ghost, okay? And once you get sealed, you always belong to God. Now, think about it this way. Once your father releases his seed into your mother and your mother's pregnant with you and your mother carries you, once your mother gives birth to you, once your mother pushes you out of her womb, you can't ever go back in her womb again. You can't ever be uh, an embryo again. You can't ever go back inside of her and come out again. Okay? So if, and also once that happens, 
you can't ever not be your parent's child, but rather the DNA of your mother and your father is built into your cells. If they take a sample of my DNA, they were able be able to extract uh, stuff that shows who my mother and my father are. Obviously, you know who your mother is because you come out of her <laughs> and they have DNA testing to prove who your dad is because it's written in the code of your body in your cells. You understand that? Well, if your biological father's seed is that strong, because you can't ever make your parents not be who they are. Doesn't matter how you feel about them. Doesn't matter if you love them or hate them or never knew them. You can't unwrite the code in your cells. Well, the same thing is true in the spirit as it is in natural. So it is in the spiritual. And once you get born again of the word of God and the seed of God and born in the spirit, you get sealed. Okay. And you have eternal life. What does eternal mean? Eternal means forever and ever and ever. That's what. Why, why would God say that you have eternal life if it, if it was temporal? Okay. Why would God give you eternal life just to take it back? That doesn't even make any sense. Okay. You are his child forever. Now, people have argued about this, but uh, I, I should do a teaching on this because the scripture that people use to try to tell people that the Lord is talking about losing your salvation and going to hell is not that's the wrong interpretation okay hell is not even mentioned in most of those scriptures because they don't understand the difference between the judgment of god's wrath like chastisement like if your dad gets mad at you and he whips you or or he, he takes something from you or he holds you accountable for something that you did is not the same as your dad kicking you out of the family because your father can never not be your father and that's the same way with Father God. Once you get born again, he can never not be your dad. But he most certainly, if you don't believe him or if you disobey him or if you're not living the way he wants you to live, he most certainly can chastise you. He most certainly can and will hold you accountable for what you do. And you can gain or lose rewards based on how you live. You can't gain or lose your salvation because you never paid for it in the first place. Remember that Jesus paid for your salvation. So you can't gain or lose your salvation, but you can gain and lose your reward. And that's where people get confused because they think the kingdom of heaven is a place where everybody gets the same thing just because you're in it. Now everybody gets eternal life because you're saved. Everybody gets a name written in the Lamb's book of life. Everybody gets justified and made right with God, the father, because of the blood of the son. That's salvation. But once you get in the kingdom, your reward is based on your faith and obedience, your ability to HBO, to hear God, to believe God and obey God. That's why Apostle Paul is talking about running the race. That's what I talked about last Sunday, running the race set before you. Why would the Bible talk about running the race if there was nothing to run, if there was nothing to strive for? But that's not striving for salvation. That's once you get salvation then God has a life he wants you to live. One more time. Once you get born again, then there's things that God wants to do in your life. And that's what Apostle Paul is talking about, okay? But once you are saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. You're not going to hell. 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 Going to hell. Because you got saved by grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace... Are you saved through faith and that not of yourself it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I'm putting these scriptures in a chat so uh, so you can look them up as I'm quoting them. OK, for by grace, it's the gift of God. It's not of works. It's not anything that you earned. It's not anything that you deserve. It is not by your own works, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's no boasting before God like you saved yourself. OK, and you can't lose that because it was a gift that he gave to you, paid for by the blood of Jesus, the broken body of the Lord and Savior. OK. All right. Next principle. That we have forgiveness. We have forgiveness of sin, past, present and future. Lord, have mercy. If you're struggling with guilt. It's because you haven't learned how to claim your promise of forgiveness and put that sin under the blood, okay? Uh, Ephesians 1 and 7. Um, let me put that on the screen. I mean, in the chat, it's not on the screen. 
Ephesians 1 and 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. Redemption means to be bought back, to be redeemed, meaning we were sold by sin to the devil. And the Lord came to pay for us and bought us back to God with his blood. In him we have redemption through his blood. We were sold by Adam. Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. That's the Berean Study Bible. Uh, New American Standard Bible. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our wrongdoings, according to the riches of his grace. King James Bible. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. According to the riches of his grace. Okay. What does that mean? That means that his grace has provided forgiveness for all your sin, past, present, and future. People say, I don't understand how such a thing could be possible. You ain't gonna never understand it. God didn't ask you to understand it. God asked you to believe it because his grace is greater than anything a human could do. Okay, it's not human, it's divine and he has forgiven you. He has forgiven you for anything in your past. He's forgiven you for any way you're not measuring up now. Uh, you're, we're all striving, we're all striving every day, but we're not perfect. And he's forgiven you for anything you might do in your future, okay? We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So if you are struggling with guilt, you can walk into tomorrow guilt-free, okay? Now, that promise in the Bible is found in 1 John 1 and 9. And 1 John 1 and 9 says, let me put that in the chat. 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One more time. <clears throat> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that means exactly what it says. If you confess, if you acknowledge your sin before God and you confess, you admit that what you did was wrong, he is faithful and just. That means the Lord will do it every time. And that means he's justified in doing so. Do you know why he's justified in doing so? Because Jesus shed his blood for your sin and it is unjust to pay for the same thing twice. Jesus paid for your sin already. So that's why when you confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in other words, you don't have to keep living in it. So not only when you confess before God, does he forgive you and wipe you clean, but it also means you don't have to keep living in what you were living in before, okay? Powerful promises, powerful foundation that I've discovered a lot of people don't have. Now, another thing that can help you get past guilt now, the principle I'm going to give you is that when you try to bring up your sins before God, God looks at you and says, what sins are you talking about? Ah, ah. Huh. God says, what sins are you talking about? Is that in the Bible, Prophet Taylor? It is. That's in Hebrews 1 and 12. Excuse me. Hebrews 8 and 12. I said 1. Excuse me. Hebrews 8 and 12. Hebrews 8, chapter 8 and verse 12. Berean Study Bible. For I will forgive their iniquities and will remember their sins no more. New Living Translation, and I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. So let me stop here and tell you, tell you the difference between sin, transgression, and iniquity. Because the Bible uses all three of those words to talk about sin. Sin is just anything that's not like God, anything that's not perfect, anything that's not God's perfect will. Sin means to miss the mark. That's what the Lord meant when he said, we, we all of us have sinned and fall short of his glory. So in other words, nobody measures up to the standard of God. Nobody can keep all the commandments. Nobody is everything that they're supposed to be. Nobody thinks the right thoughts, says the right words, makes the right choices all the time. We all fall short of God's standard of holiness, love, faith, and perfection. That's sin. We all have that. Transgression is where you know where the line is and you cross it anyway. That's what it means to transgress. So like you have a next door neighbor and you know you're not supposed to play ball in their yard and you see the line between your yard and their yard, and you go over there, play ball over there anyway. Okay, that's a transgression. You know where the line was and you crossed it on purpose. Iniquity is where you know where the line is, 
or you cross it on purpose and then you try to act like you didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> it's not funny. It's not funny. <laughs> you know where the line is, you cross it on purpose and then you try to act like, and then try to act like, then you try to act like you didn't do anything wrong. That's iniquity. God said he will forgive you even for that. He will forgive your iniquity. He will forgive you for the times that you knew where the line was. You crossed it on purpose and you try to act like nothing happened. If you confess and you acknowledge what you did, not only will he forgive you, not only will he cleanse you, but then he forgets about it. For I will forgive their iniquities and I will remember. I will remember. What does it mean to remember? To call to mind, recall, mention. Okay. Also, think about the word dismember. What does it mean to dismember? It means to have your arm or your limb or your wrist or your leg or your foot or something cut off. It means that a part of your body is disconnected. That's what it means to dismember. But to remember is to join. And God said, I'm not going to recall. I'm not going to join. I'm not going to bring to mind your sins, your iniquities anymore. So when you try to bring up your sins before God, sins that you've already confessed and put under the blood, the Lord looks at you and says, what sins are you talking about? See that? Because not only did he forgive you and not only did he cleanse you, but he forgot about it. That's why we're supposed to forget about it. That's why Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You understand that? All right. All right. Two more principles and we'll be done. Next principle is, however, don't take God for granted. Don't take a casual attitude towards sin. And this is where a lot of people, they don't get this balance. Galatians 6 and 7. Let me put that in the chat. Galatians 6 and 7 says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What a lot of people don't understand is that forgiveness don't wipe out consequences. So in other words, what that means is that if you turn on a table saw and you run your wrist through that table saw, you cut your, your hand off at the wrist, and then you immediately turn around and say, God, why did I do that foolishness? Please forgive me. God will forgive you and cleanse you and forget about it, but you still have a dismembered hand. So now you better hope you've got enough faith to rejoin that hand or you better run to the hospital because you only have a certain amount of minutes after you've lost a limb for them to reattach it surgically, okay? So, because you still have to deal with the consequence of what you did. Still have to deal with the fallout of what you did. Like when King David got with Bathsheba, which was Uriah's wife, and he slept with her, he got her pregnant. He tried to have it covered up by having Uriah sleep with her, but Uriah wouldn't sleep with his wife because there was a war going on. And he said he wouldn't have pleasure with his wife while his fellow soldiers were on the battlefield. So then David had Uriah killed. God forgave David for doing that, but there were some heavy consequences. He had war. There was no peace in his house for the rest of his life. When his children rebelled at him, he ended up getting killed. One of his sons raped one of his daughters. Uh, the baby that they had conceived, David and Bathsheba, during their illicit affair, that baby died. And he had trouble for the rest of his life because he had consequences. So in other words, the balance to God's forgiveness and cleansing and all that is that forgiveness don't wipe out consequences. You're still going to reap just exactly what you sow. Uh, one time I uh, heard the late great doctor, Apostle Frederick Casey Price said, he went to a restaurant one time and saw a really, really heavy woman, had a seven course meal and three kinds of dessert. And she, before she sat down to eat, she said, in the name of Jesus, I cast out the calories. <laughs> Ah, uh, he was preaching a series called Faith Factor Foolishness. That's foolishness, y'all. You can't cast all on calories. Wouldn't that be the bomb.com? Wouldn't that be just 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 the crank if you could eat whatever you wanted and you could cast out the calories? Just be like, in the name of Jesus, this ain't gonna make me fat. In the name of Jesus, this is 2,000 calories, but I declare it to be 200 calories. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something if that was actually true? But no, every piece of food that you eat and put in your body affects you. It affects your health. That whole thing about you are what you eat is 100% absolute truth. 
So even if you ask God to forgive you for a bad diet, you're still living in the body you have up to that point because of the choices you made. So God will forgive you for your dietary sins. God will forgive you for gluttony. God will forgive you for not taking good care of your temple. But you still got to live in the body you built up to that point. And if you wanted to do different, then you got to change your choices because forgiveness does not wipe out consequences. Forgiveness does not wipe out consequences. Forgiveness does not wipe out consequences. You can't eat all this rich food and then cast out the calories. You can't, it does not work that way. You can't do that. That's genie. That's magic concept of God. That's why this thing is called no more genies. No more magic concept of God thinking that you can make choices and not get consequences. So just because God forgives you, and he will when you confess, because he promised that he would, doesn't mean there's not consequences. Okay, and that's where a lot of believers have gotten confused because they're surprised that there are still consequences to your actions, even though we have forgiveness of sin, because there is, there are consequences to your actions. Okay, I can't stress that enough. Okay, so the principle was, the principle before that was when you try to bring up your sins, God says, what sins are you talking about? But the next principle is don't take God for granted. Don't take a casual attitude towards sin because you're still going to reap just exactly what you sow. Just because God forgives you, cleanses you, and washes you clean does not mean there are no consequences to what you did. I can't hit that point hard enough. So the Bible wouldn't spend all the time the Bible spends talking about wisdom. And the Bible wouldn't spend all the time the Bible spends talking about being wise and, and, and thinking about your way and planning your steps and asking God to order your steps if consequences didn't matter. Think about it. If consequences didn't matter, why would the scripture be talking about ordering my steps in the word and a good man, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and thy word is a, a lamp unto my fire and a light unto my path. Why does the Bible talk about the way we live and the way we choose and the way we walk on this earth if it didn't matter? If forgiveness means there weren't going to be no consequences, because that's not what forgiveness means. Forgiveness means God wipes the debt off your account because Jesus' blood already paid for that debt. That's why he's just to forgive you. It does not mean you didn't trigger a consequence by what you did. You understand? I'm trying to be sure you get the balance here. I'm trying to be sure that things are clear because there's been so much bad teaching. That's why so many believers believe so many uh, crazy things that you could do something and it wouldn't trigger a consequence just because God forgives you. Just because we're already forgiven. We confess our sins to claim our forgiveness, not to earn our forgiveness. We're already forgiven. When the Lord said it was finished, it was finished on the cross. He shed his blood. His body got broken. His blood and water came out. He got broken for us. He finished the work. He paid for everything on the cross. And you are, are forgiven, past, present, and future. That's one side. But the other side, the balance is forgiveness does not wipe out consequences. So you still got to be careful what you choose, okay? Because you're still going to trigger a consequence and it's still, you're still going to deliver what you chose, okay? So if you're morbidly obese and you're super, super overweight and you ask God to forgive you for your gluttony, he will forgive you. But now if you want to lose weight and get in shape, you have to make different choices so you can reap a different harvest. Because it did not wipe out all the choices you made up to that point. It wiped out the debt of sin on your account, but it did not wipe out the impact of your choices. Understand? I can't stress that enough. That's that's something that people have been so confused about, both saints and sinners alike. That's the thing. Unbelievers sometimes don't get that. And believers sometimes don't get that. Why? Right? It's a it's a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy and travesty. If you were raised in such a way to think that God's forgiveness means you ain't going to reap just exactly what you sow, because you will. So that's why we need to be careful what we're sowing, because it's going to come up some kind of way at some point. All right. Here's the last one for tonight. God's word is unchanging. It's not based on feelings. It's based on facts. Let's look at Malachi 3.6, and let me put that on the screen. Malachi 3 and 6. A lot of people are where they are in life right now because they didn't understand they were going to have to reap just exactly what they sowed. Malachi 3 and 6. 
Erica, Erica, what's up, Erica? She said, Nina McCray. All right, Malachi 3 and 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. God was telling the children of Israel that the reason that they were still around was because of all of God's promises to them. Can you say hello to Erica? Hello, Eric. And uh, hey to Ryan as well. And say hello to her husband. To Ryan as well. Let's see all. All right. <clears throat> Thanks for the tagging. Okay. And so, uh, <clears throat> and so the last one is, last principle is, the Lord says, I don't change. I don't change. I'm the Lord. I change not. There's another scripture that says, there's not even a shadow of turning with God. Let me give you the exact address that is in James. Okay. That is James 1 and 17. There is no shadow of turning with God. Okay. And what that means is that God is so stable until there's not even a hint of a shadow of a turn with God. The Lord doesn't change. The Lord doesn't move. I'm the Lord. I change not. That means his word doesn't change. That means that the word of God, the promises of God, are not based on how you feel. And that is where another huge place where people get confused and people get hung up and people don't know what to do because they mistakenly think that because of my feelings, because of how I feel, uh, that somehow that negates the word of God. It does not negate the word of God either way. So in other words, if you believe something that's wrong, that you want to be right, if God says it's wrong, if God says it's sin, it's sin, no matter how you feel about it. And if you are feeling guilty, but God says he has forgiven you, then he's forgiven, you're forgiven. Just because you don't feel forgiven doesn't mean you aren't forgiven. You understand? So none of it is based on how you feel. Now, the good news is that, yes, we need to accept the word of God emotionally. And what that means is that we need to meditate on it. We need to study it. We need to get it in our souls so we can have the joy of the Lord by thinking his thoughts. Because when you meditate on God's thoughts, when you meditate on God's word, you make his thoughts your thoughts. And that will always produce life and joy because his words produce life and joy in the soul. So we accept the word of God mentally, emotionally, and volitionally. In other words, what that means is we think the way God wants us to think, which produces the feelings of what God wants us to feel. And then we choose what God wants us to choose. But it's not based on that. It's not based on whether or not you feel it. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not based on whether or not you feel it. For example, if and when you go to the gym, for those of y'all that still go to the gym with your mask on, uh, trying to sweat in a pandemic and breathe on their machines. Because <laughs> uh, I, you know, do different things when I work out, work out now. But anyway, uh, you don't go to the gym. You don't lose weight. You don't have an exercise program based on how you feel. Because you're not going to feel like it every day. And that's a huge mistake that a lot of believers make when they first get saved. That is a huge struggle for baby Christians. Because they say, I don't feel saved. Or I don't feel saved today. You are saved because God said you were. Okay. Do you feel like your mother's child every day? Not every day. Do you feel like your father's child every day? Not every day. Do you feel whatever it is your job title is? Do you feel like that every day? Do you feel like I'm a well, fill in your job title? Do you feel like that every day? Not every day. Okay. But it's not based on how you feel because you are that thing. Okay. So the word of God is based on fact. It's not based on feelings. I can't tell you how many Christians have missed the promises of God entirely. You didn't hear me good gravy from the Navy. 
they have missed the promises of God entirely because they were waiting on a feeling. They were waiting on now, let me say here, since I'm here, a lot of people get confused on what it means to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So once again, we have to go with what the word says. <clears throat> I want you to, to, to read through the New Testament and see what happened every time somebody in the New Testament got filled with the Holy Ghost. When they got filled with the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. That does not always mean your prayer language. Sometimes it's translation. Remember that the miracle of, of Pentecost was not Hanamakasana, Shika Mahana Haya, Hirake Sidi Hobo, it was a prayer language. It was, they were speaking and everybody around them heard them in their own tongue. So sometimes tongues is languages. Sometimes tongues is translation. Sometimes tongues is prayer language. So when people in the New, New Testament got filled with the Holy Ghost, they had languages, they had translation, they had prayer language. When people got filled with the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, they got bold. Boldness came upon them. When people got filled with the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, they got empowered. They got empowered to do what the Lord told them to do. When people got filled with the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, they got discernment. They could see demons. They could see unclean, unclean spirits. They could see something in the spirit that they knew how to cast out. When people got filled with the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, they got visions. Sometimes God talks to you in a dream, but sometimes you are wide awake. And the spirit of God through his filling will open up the spiritual realm and show you something. And you're wide awake like I am right now. You out going about your business. You out living your life, going about your day. And Holy Ghost pulls back the curtain and shows you something. You see that? So I bring all that up to say some people have seen different people's reaction to being filled with the Holy Ghost and think that that's the same way it is for everybody. Because some people, when they get filled with the Holy Ghost, they pass out. Some people, when they get filled with the Holy Ghost, they get so full of joy, they run around the church. Some people get filled with the Holy Ghost and they holler because the power of God on you is so strong, you can't help but open up your mouth and praise it. Okay? See, people react differently. And some people, I remember one time we were ministering uh, on our prophetic team at a church and I was in a circle and we were trying to help people learn how to prophesy. And there's this one lady in the circle who had never prophesied before. So I asked her, have you ever been filled with the Holy Ghost? And she said, no. And I said, so have you ever flowed in the prophetic? She said, no. So I showed her how on the spot. I was like, this is how you get filled with the Holy Ghost. And as soon as I showed her how to get filled with the Holy Ghost, the prophetic words just started flowing to the point where she got overwhelmed. Because Holy Ghost hit her hard and that prophetic flow started coming out. And she, she was like, whoa, whoa, and it was her first time in her life. You see what I mean? So the reason I'm bringing, that up, bringing all that up is to say, that stop looking for a feeling and stop looking for a specific reaction. You gonna react like you react. It's not the same for everybody. Some people get filled with the Holy Ghost and, and you don't understand what the Lord is doing on the inside of them because God released a purging fire. I felt God's purging fire. Ooh, Lord, that purging fire hurts. You got to praise him. That purging fire is burning stuff out of you, burning stuff out of you that don't need to be there. I felt that fire more than once. I kid you not. I've also felt Jeremiah fire where the Lord gave me a prophetic word and I don't want to release it. Then it started burning inside of me. It started burning inside of me. It lit my bones up. Jeremiah said it was like fire shut up in my bones. It lit me. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I didn't have no rest until I released the word of the Lord because it's burning on the inside of me like fire. I felt that fire too. It's different. That's my point. It's different for different people. It's not based on a feeling. And I can't tell you the number of times I've seen people, you know, think they had to imitate somebody else's experience or think that because they saw other people pass out that they were going to pass out or it's different for different people. It's different for different people. And what is the spirit of God doing in you when he fills you? See what I mean? And you get you can get you're supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost every day. And when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, that looks different on different people. Like my sister's uh, prophetess, when she gets filled with the Holy Ghost, she speaks in tongues a lot. When she talks, the, the tongues come out of her as prayer language. And tongues just jump out of her. And praise the God, just jump out of her mouth when she gets filled with the Holy Ghost. When I get filled in the Holy Ghost, I tend to see and hear stuff in the spirit. Not that I haven't gotten tongues, not that, you know, stuff like that hasn't happened. 
But when I get filled with the Holy Spirit, I tend to see and hear stuff in the spirit. OK, because that's the way the Holy Ghost deals with me. It's different for different people. You see what I mean? It's just different for different people. I've been in situations where I've been ministering and I saw the spirit that was on people when they walked up to me. When they walked up to me, I saw what they just got through doing. That's happened to me multiple times in my life and in my ministry where people are standing before me. And they just got through doing something and I can see what they just got through doing. Uh, one time uh, I was <clears throat> uh, uh, wide awake, got an open vision while I was wide awake. Uh, one time I was ministering and the Lord put the words in my mouth as I was talking. He was telling me what to say. I was just listening to Jesus. I was just repeating what I heard. And some people were saying to me, David, how could you know that? And I was like, I didn't. The Lord was talking to me and then I talked to you. See what I mean? That's a prophetic flow. So that's what I mean when I say it's going to be different at different times. And it's going to be different for different people. But the main thing I'm trying to get you to understand on this last point is don't be looking for a feeling. Look for her, however it is the Lord is going to deal with you. The reason that some people pass out when they get filled with the Holy Ghost is because it's that peace. It's that release. One of the things that the Lord does when he comes in your life is he starts lifting your burdens off of you, meaning that the weight of carrying your life, the Lord starts teaching you how to transfer that weight to him. Transfer your worry, transfer your stress, transfer your guilt, transfer your shame. And that's why if you notice, those of you that know how to come into God's presence through worship, if you notice the first thing that happens when the Lord comes in the room is that your self-consciousness leaves. The first thing that God lifts off of you all the time when we're in corporate worship is self-consciousness. And you can run around the church like a child. You can dance, you can cry, you can sing, you can do whatever you want to do because it's like being like a little kid because if, when the Lord shows up, he takes center stage because we all have been cursed with that terrible self-consciousness. That comes from sin that was Adam and Eve. Because remember when Adam ate that fruit, the eyes of them were open and they both knew they were naked and ashamed and they got afraid and guilty and all that. That's where that comes from. God had never meant for us to be ashamed. God had never meant for us to be afraid. God had never meant for us to feel guilty. And God had never meant for us to be self-conscious. Did you know that? All that comes from sin. Remember all that terrible uh, 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 stress and drama and angst you felt when you were a teenager going through puberty? Like you walked in school and you had a, 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 a mole or a pimple or a blackhead on your lip and you thought all people did all day long when they were staring at that pimple on your lip and you couldn't halfway go to class because you're so embarrassed because you had, you know, a breakout with your acne or a blackhead or something like that, that's self-consciousness. God ain't never meant for us to go through that. Did you know that? Did you know that all that angst we go through as teenagers is not from God? Did you know that? That's from sin. That comes from sin, fear, shame, guilt, uh, anger, uh, toxic anger, all that's from sin. That's not from the Lord. And so one of the first things that the Lord does with his blessed presence when he comes in the room is he lifts that self-consciousness right off you. And that's why you feel that freedom. You feel that freedom to praise him, to sing, to cry, to clap your hands, to dance, to run around the church, whatever it is that you do. That's why that happens. Because when he takes center stage, he lifts your birds off you. He lifts your self-consciousness off of you. And that's why some people faint under the Holy Ghost because they've been carrying some heavy loads all week long. And you come into his presence and it's the most relaxing thing you felt ever and that's why some people pass out when they get filled with the holy ghost because they're just like oh oh some people fall like a puppet whose strings have been cut because they're that all see because you can feel that stuff break off you i felt that more than once when some especially if you're casting out an unclean spirit if you need self-deliverance or if you kick somebody out your life and they was trying to bring a spirit in your life you feel it break off you now that you will feel when you get a demon cast out of you, when you get a spirit broken out of you, something going to happen. You're going to cry. You're going to puke. OK, it's going to come out your pores. You might burp. But I've been in situations where uh, I got certain people out of my life and the spirit that they had on them, I felt it break off me. I didn't even know 
that spirit was trying to worm its way in my life till I got rid of this person and then, and then spirits left with them. Uh, see, so that's what I mean when I say all these experiences are different. The feeling of the Holy Ghost, you're supposed to experience it every day. You experience it different times in different ways in different circumstances. And it has a different effect on different people. And nowhere in the scripture do you see people having all the same reactions all the time. But again, sometimes boldness, sometimes discernment, sometimes casting out of demons, sometimes rejoicing, sometimes tongues, sometimes prayer languages, sometimes open visions. You see that? So my point of bringing all that up is don't think that it's based on a feeling. That's the beauty of having a Bible. You can stand on God's word regardless of how you feel because it is in the word is the truth, not based on how you feel. It's based on facts. It ain't based on feelings. And if it's in the word that you save, it don't matter if I don't feel saved today. You save because God said you are saved. You see that? doesn't matter if you don't feel forgiven today. You're forgiven because God says you are forgiven because it's based on facts. It's not based on feeling. All right. Amen. So let me do a quick review because that's our hour. This is part three of my Who is God series. We got one more part, part four next month in May. So in this session, what I taught was that God is a gentleman. He does not force his love or his grace on anyone. Revelation 320. Once you are saved, you are always saved. You can't lose your salvation. First John 5, 11 and 12. Uh, if you are struggling with guilt, you can walk into tomorrow guilt free because we have forgiveness of sin through the riches of his grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 and 7, 1 John 1 and 9. When you try to bring up your sins, God says, what sins are you talking about? Because God don't remember your sins once you confess them. Hebrews 8 and 12, he remembers your iniquity no more. Good gravy. However, the balance to that is forgiveness don't wipe out consequences. So don't think you can live any kind of way and you won't reap consequences. Don't take a casual attitude towards sin because it's still going to produce death if you stay in it. That's Galatians 6 and 7. Okay, and finally, God does not change, Malachi 3 and 6, and his word is not based on feelings, it's based on fact. Amen and amen. All right, so that's part three of our Who is God series. Go back and watch each one of part one and part two and then watch this thing from the top. What I'm going to ask you to do, remember I told you every video, I'm going to ask you to do one thing to help me increase my reach. So share this video, share this video in as many places as you can, because we want to make sure that our concept of God is solid. One more thing I will say, and then I'm going to exit. There are so many mean religious people out there whose hearts are hard and whose faces are always crowded with a scowl. They always scowl and they always frown and then they so full of criticism. You know, I talked about last session about how the Lord doesn't have a critical spirit. Them religious mean people, remember those people didn't like Jesus either. <laughs> remember that it was the mean old religious people that thought they knew God and didn't know nothing because they did not recognize the Lord when they saw him. So if you've been abused by somebody like that, I stop by to tell you that the Lord wants to release healing in your life. So right now in the name of Jesus, I speak a word of healing. By his stripes, we are healed to all victims and experiencers of religious abuse. You do not have to stay trapped in the past of your pain anymore. If someone in church abused you, if someone in church mistreated you, if someone in church did you wrong, you can claim the promise of God that by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. So I release a word of healing to all those that have been abused by religion. Because remember, it's the religious people that hated Jesus as well. This is not a religion. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with a person. And that's exactly why you have to get to know Father. You have to get to know Jesus. You have to get to know the Holy Ghost because there are three persons in one God. And you have to get to know them because this is not a religion. This is a relationship. So healing is available for you right now. If you, believe, if you HBO, if you hear that word, you believe it and you obey it. Confess it, believe it, claim it, okay? Because it's not based on how you feel. It's based on the fact that Jesus died. Jesus allowed himself to be broken 
to heal your brokenness. All right. Amen and amen. That's it for our hour tonight. Please share this video. That's the one thing I'm going to ask you to do. Please share this video in as many places as you can because we want a solid biblical concept. Remember that everything I said, I gave you corresponding scripture. I just reviewed those scriptures and those scriptures are in the chat. So you can look them up, look them up for yourself and see what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not just making stuff up. I'm not just coming out of nowhere, but I'm speaking what the word of God actually speaks. Okay. All right. I will be here Sunday at 2.30 p.m. for our regular weekly live prophetic word. And remember uh, that those videos are also on my YouTube channel. So you can check out my YouTube channel. Uh, on my YouTube channel, I actually have the scriptures up there on the screen as I'm talking so you can see the scriptures as I'm going by as well. Okay. All right. Amen. God bless. Have a great night. I'll see you on Sunday. And remember, we have to learn God because this is not a religion. This is a relationship. Amen. God bless and good night.